I know that uh, previously I had posted that I would present something on kernel and driver, but uh, Joel's presentation is probably going to run for quite a while, so we, we thought we'd just go with that by itself. Um, so, and if you're ready, then yeah. we'll go ahead and, and get started. Yeah, sure. So, uh, thanks, Stephen. Uh, so, uh, uh, I'm a Linux kernel developer at uh, Texas Instruments, uh, and uh, I've been working on device trees for for the last year and a half. Uh, so I know a little bit about it. I, I don't know a lot about it, so I'll kind of share what I know about it with you guys, and we can keep it uh, interactive and uh, interesting. Um, so at, at TI, I, uh, I'm part of a Linux team that adds uh, support for uh, TI, pro TI processors new SOCs and new boards that are uh, continuously uh, being manufactured. And uh, uh, so as a part of that, I've been uh, able to do a lot of uh, Linux kernel development. Uh, and uh, you know that's basically my uh, experience. Uh, I started using Linux in 2007 and didn't really do much of kernel till like 2009. And then uh, in 2010, I started uh, looking at the ARM architecture and the embedded systems and those type of things. Uh, so embedded, I, I found, is a very nice uh, domain for uh, uh, kernel development because you have to deal with a lot of low-level stuff. It can, kind of like teaches you a lot about uh, the kernel and operating systems and uh, low-level software design and hardware design and those type of things. So, so that's. That's basically my introduction. So, uh, so today I'm going to talk about uh, device tree. Uh, uh, so the agenda is right there. I'm going to introduce uh, what the device tree is about. I'm going to talk about devices and drivers and how the device tree fits into the whole thing. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about uh, overlays, which I got to play with a little bit last year. And it's a nice application application of device tree, one of the many applications. I wish I could talk about more applications, but that's a really cool application, so I'll, I'll talk about that. So yeah, feel free to ask me questions, and we can keep it like really interactive and interesting. Right. So uh, the simple simplest definition of device tree is like a data structure. It's, a, it's used to represent data, basically, uh, so I'll be talking about how how we can we can use this data structure uh, in in many different ways. Uh, so it's it's more like uh, you know if you're familiar with XML data format, it's you have you have nodes and then you have uh, nodes inside of nodes, child nodes, and those type of things. And each node has a set of properties and values uh, and those type of things. So it's a pretty simple uh, concept <coughs> if, you, if you think about it. I have some rules to it. Uh, each node should have exactly one parent node. So it's like a tree. And each node is named, and each node has properties that contain data uh, of different types. So this uh, so device tree came about in the late 80s uh, with this whole open format specification, which is basically uh, an interface between uh, a specification that specifies how the firmware talks to the kernel. Uh, because uh, kernel doesn't really know much about the hardware uh, so, sometimes. So, the, so that was what the specification was about, and device tree was actually born out of that. So that's in, in simple words. So, 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 uh, so now let's talk a little bit about embedded platforms. Uh, and embedded platforms, the problem with embedded systems, in, in my experience, what I saw was Unlike the PC world, uh, you have all these buses and uh, peripherals that uh, cannot really, that are really simple and cannot really uh, be enumerated. They don't really uh, talk to tell the kernel what what they're about. And uh, unlike USB or uh, some some of the other buses like PCI, so they cannot be enumerated. That's one problem. So to solve this problem, uh, this whole concept of a platform bus was introduced in a kernel, which is basically a fake bus. Uh, it's not like a real bus like USB or PCI. And 
the virtual bus was like supposed to act like a real bus, but the kernel couldn't really tell the difference. And users, uh, the, the, the programmers would themselves tell, uh, register their devices like I2C or Spy on this fake bus, and you would kind of like hook the whole thing up into the kernel device driver model that way. Uh, because ultimately, your devices have to come from some kind of a bus. So, uh, so on this platform bus, you would have devices and drivers that are kind of registered, and uh, the platform code would kind of glue them together in some meaningful way. Much like how the PCI bus, for example, in the kernel would, would match like a, a PCI, uh, PCI device with a PCI driver. So, so this kind of a platform bus was introduced, and a simple uh, data structure platform device was introduced and then a function that you can use to register such a device. So, any questions here, so far? Yes, so uh, I think because of the driver model in Linux, right, where you have PCI bus, USB, yeah. and, and these other buses, yeah. so they wanted these drivers to fit into that model, Yeah. and that's why the platform bus was created, so that yeah. they would fit in the yeah. model. That's the purpose, as I understand it. I imagine this is less complicated than ACPI and a lot less complicated than EFI, right? Yeah, yeah, it's, yes. it's not a lot of, you can look at the code, it's, it's pretty pretty simple, it's not not a lot, it's not like you scratch your head too much reading it, and it's pretty simple. I have a question on that. I'm a software person, so I know that a lot of it. Is the cost like a bridge between the device uh, and the driver? It's more like an arbitrator, like a kind of a controller, you know, that understands the protocol and arbitrates between the devices. When you say a bus, is it a hardware or a... Like a, a it's device? supposed to be hardware, but... Well, when, um, when you say a bus, it's generally a description of two pieces together. Um, both a description of the physical hardware, but also a description of how to communicate with that hardware. So it's a two-piece... Uh, <coughs> description, when you talk about, like for instance, uh, a PCI card or a PCI e-card going into your PC, it is a description of the physical connectors, the signals, and how they interact, but it's also a description of how the protocol discovers exactly what's plugged into that section. So it's a, it's a two-part description. What you have is uh, there are discoverable buses like PCIe and uh, ISA and things like that where you can actually, uh, when you think of plug and play, that's what we're talking about where a, a bus is discoverable. You can actually figure out what's plugged into it. Some of the devices such as I2C, GPI, and SPI, they have no way to discover exactly what's plugged in there. So there's a dis uh, you're assuming that when the system boots up, you have to give it a specific description of what's plugged in. And this specific description is coming from the device tree in this aspect. That's why it's accessing the library. Exactly. When the firmware is plugged into it. It's it's basically. Basically. Is that similar right. to the app, um, abstraction there? Yes. In Microsoft. What you're, what you're doing is abstracting the physical uh, information, but you're also describing what's connected to right. it. Uh, because you can also describe the bus itself, but you also need to describe what's plugged into it. You, it can also you can also end up making essentially what is like virtual virtual buses. Say I want to make a modem bus, but if the actual interface is also <coughs> tying into a uh, PCI bus, so there's there's other ways to abstract it even further that uh, can take it. Orders of magnitude higher. Yeah, I yeah. always took it as so that the chip on there is actually the software or the firmware it talks to it. And you're creating this artificial. Well, no, we've already got the. So, like, another thing is in embedded, your device drivers, um, you do need to have things activated in the kernel side as well. So, they're, it's not quite the same as that. Does that make sense? You can, you, can have like a, you can have like a network of these buses heterogeneously connected to each other and all kinds of things hanging from them. So, uh, so this resulted in, in uh, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the, the churn in the kernel 
that uh, arose because of this. Uh, so, so this whole thing, this this whole thing about board files in the kernel, uh, that at least it, it's it's now in our past kind of, but uh, board files were these uh, C files that were created for for each custom hardware board. They would have a board file that would describe, uh, you know. A, with the abstractions that I just showed you, platform device and platform device register, they would the board the, the board files would actually have C code that uh, you know declared a data structure for a platform device for like SPI, and they would actually register the the SPI device because that particular board that that board file was supposed to represent would uh, would have such a, a device on it. So it's basically like describing the board what the board looks like. In, in, in C code, so that when a kernel boots up, it actually uh, executes code in that C file and uh, you know registers all these platform devices on the platform bus. So that was the purpose of the board file. So so let so first of all, we have so many SSCs in the ARM world, but, but on top of that, we had so many like board variants uh, uh, based on these SSCs. So it, you know there was a lot of people creating all these board files and. Uh, uh, you know, Linux OS, creator of Linux, he, one finder he really got. Excuse me. Uh, I've been out of this for a little while. You're saying there's no K config anymore? No, 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 that's not what I said. Okay, I'm, I'm trying to try to understand. No, uh, <laughs> not at all about related to K config. So there's not like a board specific config file that you do like a def config? There used to be. Uh, have yeah. Got, gotten rid of that? I haven't been. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, kind of now they're even mm -hmm. going away from configs for specific SOCs, you know, like. You have like configs like multi v7 configs and stuff like that that kind of are supposed to represent configurations for any ARM SOC. So we're kind of going away from the model of having thousands of configs. So this is what you're talking about here? No, that's not uh, oh. what I'm talking about. This is actually C code. I was talking about platform device and the platform bus. So this is C code that had to, that was being introduced in the kernel by all the people who were creating all these different board variants. And uh, that's like a huge amount of churn in the kernel for stuff that is not really code. So, uh, you know, if there was a bug in one of the one of the files, uh, people would copy paste these board files all over. And if there was a bug in one, then the bugs would, you know, that's called a cut and paste problem. Uh, copy paste code, and you know, the, you have to fix the bug in all these other places as well. So. So this is really not a good thing that was happening, and there were like a lot of merge conflicts and all that in the kernel. So Linus was really uh, uh, ranted about it, and the link is there. Uh, and uh, finally, they decided that they had the ARM guys had to do something about it. So uh, so now let's talk a little bit about device tree and how that kind of improves things. Uh, uh, before that, uh, this model of board files also wouldn't work for multi-platform kernels. So basically, uh, the kernel is uh, moving more towards uh, 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 having a single kernel binary that can execute on uh, pretty much uh, multiple platforms, not just one platform. And if you if you keep building, have these board files, C files that are uh, all being linked and com compiled and linked into the kernel, you have a pretty huge kernel binary. So it's really not a was not a sus sustainable model for that. So device tree simplifies a lot of these problems. So, so, so the question is, how can we use device tree to describe hardware, right, and keep churn out? So, so it's basically essentially used to describe hardware in the kernel. Uh, you know, and it's it's a it's a very nice separation between code and data. Like you don't want hardware description to really be code in in, in some sense. So it's 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 a nice delineation between between that and. Uh, most device tree files that you see in, in, in the kernel for ARM, they would be, you, you can see how it nicely describes the hardware, the memory, CPUs that are used, the peripherals. It's a nice, uh, you know, tree, tree that, you, that you see uh, that describes the hardware. So, uh, and, and it's also used to specify configuration, like uh, what are the serial port names, and uh, what, you can even mention, like, specify kernel boot parameters and those type of things. So. I'll, I'll show you more about that in, in a bit, but uh, so finally it was uh, in ARM, uh, for, for ARM it was turned on in version 3.0 kernel release. Uh, before that it was available in multiple platforms. 
uh, like PowerPC and all that. But for, for ARM, it was turned on in V3.0. Since then, it's being used. So I'll show you a simple uh, example just to kind of, it's a little boring to talk about details, so I can maybe uh, show you some uh, some code that. So this is the uh, this is the device tree source for uh, basically uh, platforms uh, for for the N three three five X SOC that the bigger bone is based on. So so this is what it looks like. There's a lot of details I don't want to go through, but just to show you the CPUs, how it's represented. This is a node, and then it has child CPU nodes for each CPU. And these are the properties of the CPU. <coughs> and uh, then you have something called the OCP, stand for on chip, uh, sorry, open core protocol, I guess. But so that that's the that's the parent node for all the devices on the uh, on the SOC. So you have uh, DMA controllers, uh, GPIO modules, which are children of that, and 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 this and the list goes on. So you can basically open one of these and really see what what what's on the on the chip in terms of the hardware very very nicely. Uh, and previously it was very difficult to look at it in, in these board files. So this is a nice way of of really understanding what the hardware looks like. So. So that's that's basically what, what it looks like. Hold on. So you have any questions on what I showed you just now? So the so the way you compile it is there's a device tree compiler that you would take that source file that I just showed you and you would uh, compile it. It's extremely difficult to use. I'm horrible at presentation. Okay. So, so the result uh, after you use this compiler, the result uh, that you get out of it is called a device tree blob. That's what it's called. So, what are some of the advantages? Uh, well, so I'll say like because of this kind of a model. The same kernel can be booted on multiple platforms, and this is something I really enjoy uh, uh, working on because uh, it really simplifies a lot of things. Like you can take the same kernel image and just supply it a different with a different device tree blob, and it'll boot on on fundamentally like different hardware, which is really really a nice thing. Makes development a lot easier, uh, and you don't have to compile the kernel again, which takes a lot of time. Uh, every time you need to make uh, you make a tweak to your hardware and you need to modify something, you don't have to compile the kernel because the description is not in the kernel anymore, which is really good. Uh, and because of all these reasons, board porting is also a lot easier. And device tree blobs are really fast to compile, so that's really cool. And and, and one biggest advantage is it's really compact. It's it's very small. The data format is really tiny. I'll show you the data format in some time. Compared to all these board files that were being uh, produced, uh, DTB is actually a very s small file. So, any questions? I have a question. Yeah. So, this like device tree compiler. I mean, is it is it very good in being able to output in di diagnostic messages or comments? I mean, yeah. Because it's a text file, right? The source code, so it's easy to make. It's very good at it. Like that, so I mean, yeah. It's a very good kind of find out issues and stuff. Yeah, uh, it, it, I mean, if if you have a compiler, if you have syntax error, it'll tell you right away. And you can also ask it to kind of, instead of spitting out a binary format, you can ask it to spit out a, a tree format, which actually shows you what is going to compile into the binary format. So before, so it tells you exactly what it's doing. You can. And I think actually I, I read comments somewhere that the compiler, it can also do the reverse, right? It can take the binary and it can generate the device tree source. Okay, I've never done that part. Yeah. Yeah. You can, but it is not as um, informative as the original. Uh, but to answer your question, um, the device tree compiler is good at providing you syntax errors, mm -hmm. but the context of a lot of the errors is not there right now. So if, if you put information into the device tree structure, 
that syntax is correct but doesn't apply to the driver that it's connected to, right. it doesn't tell you that what, it, what you told it is, is not, not valid information. As long as the syntax is correct, it, it'll pass it through. But the information you pass it may not be applicable to the driver. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense. I mean, it's easy to get like an X step as one folks on the, on the compiler doesn't know that. Yeah. And that's, that's one of the things that, that uh, is actually being worked on by the Linux Foundation. Uh, they actually have a uh, summer project that uh, is coming up for 2014 to add more contextual uh, debugging and error message. So it will actually inspect the driver and say the, the values that you provided me or the variables that you've used are not actually used in this driver. So something that you told me is incorrect. And that, that just doesn't exist right now. So I'll talk a little bit about the, so now we know what device tree is about, sort of. Uh, talk a little bit about the kernel device driver model. And before that, I wanted to introduce this, this structure in the kernel. Uh, basically, uh, there's a mechanism in the kernel called the init call mechanism. And what happens is, uh, uh, as soon as the kernel boots, uh, the first process in the kernel is the init process. and uh, you think that the first thing that the init process executes is your init program, like your, you, you know, uh, the, the, like a, a startup program or something. But before that happens, uh, before that can happen, there's a lot of drivers that have, devices and drivers that have to be initialized. So I, I don't want to like, uh, I don't want people to see stars, but is it really difficult to follow what I'm talking about? Or? Because if, if, it, if it is, then there's no point. Okay, okay. So, uh, so, the, so, so every every initialization function in the kernel would register into one of these init calls. So you have sometimes you have like timer code that has to execute clocks and all that uh, have to be initialized. So you, that would go into early. You know, power management has to turn on uh, peripherals and those type of things very early. So that goes into early, and then there are different layer levels, you know. Uh, so, in so so I'll come back to this in some time. So here's a little output. <coughs> if you pass the init call, kernel, kernel boot art, you see, it's very nice to debug. You can see exactly what the kernel is doing during its initialization stage. So you just have to pass init call for that. So come back to this. So the device tree is actually parsed in the arch in a call, and sometime later the drivers are passed. So remember now we don't have board files anymore. So so the kernel has to really uh, parse the device tree, take all the nodes in the device tree, all the devices on it, and has to register it with the platform bus, and then the drivers later will will do the same thing, and then the platform bus has to. Uh, you know, match the devices with the drivers and that type of thing. So this is going to be in a post test. Sorry, is this being a post test? Post test? Yeah, call it self test. No, this is way after that. This mm -hmm. is after okay. the operating system is operating system is already alive and it's initializing. So. The, so this, this, is a, this is how the hookup of the platform bus happens. First devices and then drivers. So you don't have board files anymore to do that. And this is some code fragment that I copied. Uh, so as I was saying in the arch init call, uh, you have a function. You have a function called customize machine that uh, uh, that calls a function or platform populate, and that is what uh, actually uh, registers those. Uh, uh, devices on, on the platform bus. So uh, this is like boring code. I don't want to bore you guys. But any questions? Is, is this done during uh, the decompressing? Uh... No, no. This is way after decompressing. Yeah, decompressing is like the first thing, and then after you have memory management, initialization, all that kind of stuff. So this is all like like a complicated. Level. This is yeah. This is after the scheduler kicks in, and it spawns a new th uh, thread, kernel thread. Called the init thread, which has PID one. It's the first first process in Linux in a Linux machine. And before it can uh, execute the init program with slash sb and slash init, it has to do all this. Before that. Yeah, 
it has to it has to it has to do all because it also uh, it also has to mount your root file system to read the init program. So it can't do that if it doesn't initialize the device in the browser. So it has to it has to do all that. So as a part of that, it 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 it, it registers devices on the platform bus. So here's a simple example. It's uh, uh, so a GPIO node. Uh, so I put this slide and talk about a compatible property, which is how the, the the platform bus connects the devices to the drivers. So you'd have in your device tree, you would have what I'm describing there is I have a GPIO at a, at a particular location and a compatible property uh, telling me that it's an OMAP 4 platform GPIO device. So that, that string is really important. And then the driver uh, has struct, has structure in that in itself too that tells the, the platform bus that this is, you know, uh, I, I support all devices that are, that that have a compatible string of OMAP4 GPR. So it's kind of like a, a way uh, for the kernel to match devices and drivers together. So, you know, so it's a, it's a nice abstraction. Yeah. Yeah. What is the, you know, the property called the name and the, the mass table? What is the difference? Dot name and you give uh, a parameter, right? That's just a driver name, uh, because the, the the match table can can be big. It's like a it's like actual table. Like a, a particular driver can support support many different types of devices. Okay, so the kernel object, uh, so when I create a dot ko file, uh, it should match with the uh, the compatible property, right? Not the name. I I didn't get the question. So when I you know, when I compile a specific driver and when I get a dot .ko file, mm -hmm. so for example, I2C driver, touchscreen driver. <clears throat> so what I'm asking is, is it the uh, dot .name property <coughs> or is it the dot .compatible property I have to match? So I have to give a name for the driver, right? So for example... No, the for, as far as the devices, as far as specifying what devices you want to... Uh, you want the driver to support this concern, you don't need to, that, that na dot name doesn't hold any any value, as far as I'm aware of. Co uh, compatible is the only thing you need to worry about. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, and what happens is, as soon as platform, uh, so what happens is, you register the GPIO in the arch in it called, the device would be passed, passed, and the GPIO would, uh, would be registered as a platform device, uh, you know, without you having to do anything. And then in the device stage, uh, the driver would uh, register itself. And as a part of that, the probe function that you see there would be called. Because uh, now the driver has to do something about that. It has to kind of, uh, it, it knows that, the driver knows that, OK, this device is really on the system, on the platform bus, uh, like, a spy, like a GPIO driver in this case. So it would run the probe function, and then it would do the GPIO initialization, and register itself with the GPIO, GPIO with the GPIO framework, and those type of things. So this is I'm basically trying to show the link between you specifying something in your device tree, and then it, it going all the way to the to the driver, and you know things. That's how the things are linked up. Same questions or? So, uh, the device tree, you compile everything into one kernel, right? Yeah. So, is there a performance trade-off with respect to... You, you don't compile the device tree into your kernel. Okay. Yeah, that's the point. Like, uh, with, the, uh, with the way things are going in ARM world, we are approaching the single Z image concept, a single image concept where you, 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 if you compile device tree blobs in your kernel, you have to compile every device tree blob. And so that breaks that model. So the idea is that these blobs can come from anywhere, and the kernel image is the same, something like that. You know. So what does a device tree blob look like? Uh, so, <laughs> so yeah, that's that's interesting. So that's actually David. David Anders is sitting at the, the back, this <laughs> Halloween costume with TV written on. Very creative, I thought. So. <laughs> uh, that's funny. So, 
So now, so let's see what a, a device tube block really looks like in the inside. And these details are really boring, but I try to make it like as interesting as possible. Uh, it has a magic number in the be beginning of it. it. Tells the kernel is it a really valid blob or not, and it can get corrupted, you know, when it's loaded. So if it's really if that magic number is wrong, then it, it flags an error. It doesn't have checksums and all that because it's supposed to be tiny. So uh, so that, I guess that's why they didn't have checksums and those sort of things. Is that a random number generator? No, no, it's a magic number. It's fixed, like, uh, it's fixed. yeah, it's fixed. And Kernel has a hard code and checks for that magic number when it blows the block. Oh, oh, it's only at the end. Then it has the size of the DDB, which it needs to know. It's a header, so it tells you how big the whole blob is. It tells you the version of the device tree format used, because uh, different device tree versions have different ways of doing funny things. So, how does the kernel know how to reset different versions? I mean, if you have one that's a device tree compiler from an old one and you have a newer kernel, is that, do you have to match that somehow? I, I really haven't seen that version used, but if somebody knows the answer to that, I, I haven't seen how it's used in a kernel, really. Uh, I've only heard of somebody having an issue when they took a pretty new one <clears throat> and used it with something that was like a 3.0 dot, oh dot like two or something like that and had an issue where they were pulling in then they had to backport in order to support some sort of weird bus um, and and they had issues. Yeah. But I can, yeah. Not generally. I yeah, it's really. not something you wouldn't want to mess with and, you know. You definitely don't think it's that when it happens. Yeah. So it's probably mainly to ensure compatibility. Yeah. Um, it's some, something that probably is generated by the compiler so that, it, you know, Knows. But I can look look up details uh, if you want. The the ABI for a lot of the device tree stuff is not fixed at the moment. It's still going under a lot of review and a lot of uh, evaluation and changes. And they wanted to make sure that as they're going through this process, they have some legacy support as, as the development progresses. And currently, there's a huge amount of debate going on about how at what point are they going to say that the ABI is actually stable? So until then, they're using these revision numbers or version numbers to help do Track that. consistency between different versions. Yeah, I think that's exactly the answer to that. And 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 the header also has offsets <coughs> inside. Uh, so you have different blocks inside the device tree file itself in the binary. And the first block is called a memory reserve block and uh, basically, uh, I haven't seen that used, but I assume that what is used for is the kernel goes through this, uh, this, this block and looks at each of those addresses and it knows that it's not supposed to use those addresses for memory allocation. So it doesn't, uh, it, it just considers those regions in the memory reserve block to be holes. And it has a string block, which is very interesting. Uh, it's basically a table of strings uh, with each string as an offset. And uh, an index, and it has a very specific purpose. They have a string block, which actually describes the whole, uh, you know, the tree uh, format, like tell the nodes and the nodes within the nodes and the properties. So that so so the actual device tree block sits in the string block. So so the header contains offsets to each of these string blocks, much like an executable file that has uh, offsets to each of the sections that, like the data section, program section, all that in the executable. So you'd have a header with all those offsets. So the device tree blob has an offset for each of those blocks. And uh, so now let's talk about the structure block. It has these tags that are used to uh, used to uh, kind of tell uh, uh, anyone reading the, the, the binary that this is where a node starts and this is where a node ends. And so you have these nested 32-bit tags uh, nested within each other that uh, slide. So you kind of had to think about how would you do it if you were this, de defining a binary format like that. So, so these tags are 32-bit bit, bit values. Any questions on tags or offsets? Uh, oh, the, the Jimmy question. Uh, I've seen that the DTB starts with the name of the processor series, right? Like uh, AM software video bone black. Yeah, that's just a file name. That means not, that doesn't so mean does anything. Mean, does it mean that the DTB is tied to that particular processor? Or? Yeah, it's kind of like, yeah, you get an idea that it's for this particular, and then they have soc underscore board dot 
uh, variations as well. Tell you that this is SOC, this is board. So you, you can name it whatever you want. It doesn't matter. Once it's loaded, it doesn't matter what it's called. And then inside this uh, structure block, uh, uh, you have properties and values. So that's pretty much all you have in device. You have nodes. You have nodes having properties and, and values uh, with values. And then you have nodes inside those nodes with each node again having like uh, properties and values, so forth. So, so just like how you, I showed you about the node start and tag, you have an OFDT prop tag, so again, 32 bit value, tells you that this, what's going to follow is really a property. And then you have a 32 bit offset into the string, string block that I was just talking about, that tells you what the name of the property is. So this is very interesting because uh, the property really doesn't contain the name, the, the name string, it contains an offset into the string block. The idea is that you can have properties that are repeated throughout the device tree block, and you don't want to like have every string replicated all over. So, so all, all, all the property has to contain is the 30-bit offset from the string, uh, from the top, from the start of the string block. So, so the, again, the idea is for embedded systems, you need small. De the device block has to be small. That's why it's so suitable for embedded systems. It's tiny. So that helps. And then you have the length of the property. Uh, following the offset, and then you have the actual property, the binary data itself. It's pretty boring. Question. Um, you say, I mean, the device tree, like the compiled kind of logs, kind of and all. So, I mean, for example, for like a bigger board, is it like a you know, kilobyte or two, or is it like 10 kilobyte? Or what, what yeah, I think it's, uh, it'll be like something around that two to four kilobytes. Or something. The, the biggest one I've ever seen was uh, basically 62, 63 kilobytes. Wow, that's big. <laughs> that's a big one. Yeah, but yeah, I'm sure that would be. The, the intention was originally for most of the device tree when, when it came out for power PC was so that it would fit into either an I2C or SPI EE prompt. Okay. So the goal was to make sure that the compiled form of it was small enough in to get into one of those. And you can find a lot of device tree uh, bills that are small enough to fit in 256 bytes. Yeah. It's just a few, sometimes it's just a couple of bytes, yeah. I've seen that, yeah. That's pretty awesome. So, uh, so I just wanted to show you a little bit about uh, the properties. Uh, how are we doing at time? Oh, we have plenty of time. So we get till ten. Yes, I'm not to cook. No, just kidding. So, so this is a nice page. Uh, it's on my slides if you want. It talks about how to use <coughs> the structure of a device tree and all that. And uh, so I basically wanted to show you what device tree properties look like. So it's pretty basic. You just have four different types of properties. You have a string property, which is converted into ASCII uh, uh, binary values, and it's in the property. Then you have a cell property, which is uh, nothing but a set of 32-bit integers. You can represent them as hex or, uh, yeah. And the, this is just how you uh, represent it, the angle brackets. That's how you represent a cell property. And it's not like it's converted into something uh, magical. Under, under the hood, it's just a set of 32-bit uh, values uh, in, in, that are a part of that property. And then you have a binary property that you mentioned with uh, square brackets. And you have mixed. You can even have mixed properties that have a string and have, have like you know uh, cells and binaries. That, you know, it's all uh, finally converted into a, a, the whole thing is going to be like a bunch of 32-bit integers that follow each other and, you know, that's basically, uh, this is all that, if you're ever going to do like device tree stuff, this is, these are the, these are the only formats that you need to care about, the, that you would need. And uh, there's one, uh, one format that I, uh, there's one uh, property uh, type that I missed called the p-handle, and this is how you represent uh, uh, this is how you represent uh, a, 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 you, you point to another node in, in a device tree. So I'll show you an example of that. For example, uh, if I were to, if I had a, uh, what's a good example? So you have a, so you have a, for example, you have an MMC uh, controller that needs a DMA. So uh, you would 
actually have to have a property called DMAs that points to uh, uh, the the node node that represents the DMA controller. So, so so how would you convert that? Because what I just showed you was just thirty-two bit numbers. So you have to represent a reference to another node as a thirty-two bit number. So. So that's called a p-handle. A p-handle is nothing but a, a, a sort of like a, a reference to a particular node. So every node that is referred to would be given a special value by the compiler called a p-handle. Uh, and it's actually uh, it's actually incremental. So every node that is referred to, uh, the compiler checks if each node is actually referred to by anyone else or not. And if it's referred to, then it gives it like one. And then the next node that is referenced given like a value two, and then three. So EDMA would have one of those values, and that 32-bit number is stored in, in in that in that property. So that's basically the concept of the handles, just a dumb re like reference to another node. Any questions on it? It's kind of how how it uh, you know it's it's a pretty dumb format. It's pretty simple format. So how would you have have this kind of cross reference between uh, nodes? So, so where is the P handle? Is it 24 or is that the memory address? No, that's the, the, so this is, uh, so I say in angle brackets you can specify uh, this kind of mixed type of uh, uh, value. So this is nothing but an array of P handle 24, P handle 25. So in, in the structure it looks like four integers uh, in the binary. 24 is actually the argument to the DMA controller here saying that I would uh, say MMC actually is hooked up in the hardware to DMA controller channel number 24. So the DMA, so the DMA controller knows that, okay, uh, all requests on channel 24 have to go to the MMC controller. Okay, so 24 is the PN. No, the, the PN is not visible here. You just say, no. you just say reference, reference EDMA. You just have to say that. And the way it works is, uh, When you compile the dice tree, the dice tree, the P handle gets assigned. Yeah, so, so it's, it's a reference back to that other yeah. name. So it's actually not assigned. There's no number called P handle. What the device tree compiler does is every node that is referenced to it puts a Linux comma P handle property that you can't see, and when the kernel boots, it knows that it, it just looks like okay, which which node in in the tree has a Linux P handle property? Okay, let's assign P handle number one to that. So the kernel does that. It's not really that the format has a number in it. Oh, okay. And then, so it's, it's really, it's like incremental. Okay, the next node that is referenced to is EDMA. So let's assign EDMA number, uh, p-handle number two, and any node that, any, if anyone refers to p-handle two, then it's got to be EDMA. Now yeah. I gotta ask you, why is this data type important if it's just done by <clears throat> the compiler and the kernel uses it? Do we do anything with that? No, you don't have to, but, uh, I mean, the way I de understand things is always I go to the internals first. Oh, right, so. Okay. so there's nothing you need to. It's not I mean, a special data type that you need to worry about when you do the configuration. No, it's all right. No, you don't. But as a, with all things, if you're doing kernel development, I mean, details are everything. So you would find definitely find these kind of concepts useful. But it's not like you need to know what the handle is to. You just have to say add something, <coughs> and then you just refer to it in your device tree. <coughs> So uh, sometimes, uh, yeah, this, this slide is pretty out of place. Uh, basically, I was trying to show that you don't always have, uh, you don't always get rid of board files when you do board port. Sometimes you still need uh, some code outside of a board file. So, and then you have to explicitly call this function to parse the device tree and register those devices on a platform bus. So it's not always like you can get rid of board files. Most of the time, you can though. So uh, yeah, so now moving to the third part of my talk. Uh, so on, uh, so that was on device tree internals, and the, what I talked about p-handle will help us understand some of the other things I'm going to talk about. Uh, so uh, so when all this device tree stuff was going on, Spentalis Antonio, who's an engineer I worked with a while back, uh, uh, he uh, came up uh, with this concept of uh, Cape bus. So I'm going to talk a little bit about, about why it was introduced. 
So not only the board, but you can have uh, different uh, daughter boards on top of a board that you need to describe sometimes. And again, we don't have board files anymore. So how do we, um, how do we uh, uh, describe these, these kind of things? And uh, like a company like CircuitCo that produces these things called caves, uh, you know, there are plenty of them. And Pentelis, uh, uh, you know, noticed this and uh, he came up with this thing called cave bus. Basically, the idea is uh, you need some kind of a plug and a plug and play mo model, and maybe David can uh, explain this better. But uh, uh, after the kernel boots, you have a device tree that's already uh, uh, instantiated, and uh, uh, now you have this daughter board that's connected. And what are you going to how are you going to what are you going to do about that? So you need a way to uh, to modify the device tree dynamically at runtime, and uh, you know that ca uh, that came up with this whole concept of Cape Bus, which is not really called Cape Bus anymore. It's called overlays. It's called device tree overlay, where you take a fragment device tree block and you over overlay it, parse it, and you overlay it on onto the live device tree in the, that's in the kernel memory at runtime. So, for example, uh, I have an LCD. Uh, board that's connected to a bigger bone. And uh, really, uh, when the kernel boots, there's no description of uh, the fact that there's an LCD board that's connected to to the expansion. And let's like, say uh, to the LCD, LCD bus, or say if you have a spy display that's connected to the spy bus. You know that there's a spy bus, but you don't know what's on it, something like that. So. Uh, you had a question? Yeah, I think before we maybe dive into that, I think one important detail is, I mean, when the system boots up, right, it expects the kernel image. So, I mean, how does the kernel know about the device tree? I mean, does it get passed as a kernel parameter by address? Yes. Or, I mean, are there, are there different methods? And yes. Where is it normally stored? You know, these are kind of like... Yeah, so I it's basically it's like uh, <coughs> when, you, when you boot a kernel, you can even pass a RAM disk. People do RAM disk boots mm -hmm. and stuff. Uh, you can't just boot a kernel. You need to. There's a structure called a tags, as far as I understand it. And a tags is a way for you to pass your uh, kernel command line and your, uh, you know, the boot parameters that is, and the RAM, the RAM disk image location in memory, and and also the device tree now. So is this what the kernel can accept, or is this like the parameter that you would put like in vboot or something? That's the same thing. Uh, no, uh, I mean, I can put in all kinds of stuff in the U boot, boot string, but it may not, the kernel may not understand it. So, which part are you talking about? Maybe boot, boot string as in the boot arguments? Yeah. The boot Did arguments you, you put in the, boot, in the command line. So, you, you boot up your board, you're at the U boot prompt, and then you put in some parameters for the kernel to boot, but um, is that what the, command, the kernel will accept? Or is that, are you talking about something else? The kernel command line is that, yeah. It's it's in the kernel documentation. Uh, okay. To, to answer your question there, the kernel, once it starts, needs to know where the device tree blob is. It, it can be in many different locations. It actually can be stored in another E prom. Uh, it can be loaded into the memory at the same time. Uh, that message can be passed to it uh, via the, the boot command uh, for the kernel. Uh, and you can also pass scripts in U-boot to load it into specific memory locations. So if you think about it, instead of being device tree blob and think of it as a uh, RAM disk, anything that you can do with a RAM disk, you can do with the device tree blob in the same aspect that you can bond a RAM disk to your kernel image, yeah, you can totally. put the RAM disk in memory, you can store it in a third party location, any one of those things you can do with the device tree log. You just need to let the kernel know when you boot up where it should expect to see that device tree log. So, uh so this is just a rough uh, description. Uh, it, when you boot up a kernel, you have to pass it a couple of things that are passed by the bootloader. So you would pass it the boot string, a kernel command line, uh, 
basically telling it that you want the boot, you want the log to be verbose or something like that. You know, there's just different ways of. Uh, so that was my question. Do you pass that guy into that? No, 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 no. This is separate. So, okay. so the bootloader would load this at a particular memory uh, location in the DDR, and you would pass that <coughs> address to the kernel. So the kernel knows, okay, to get the blob, I need to go to this address. So that how does it pass it to the kernel? Is that a command line, or is it linked into the kernel to look at this address? No, it's not linked in. You pass it, uh, you pass it as one of the parameters. The command line is something else. Command well, line is not The bootloader would load to tell it. Well, there, there's kernel options to configure it in several different ways, and that's what I was getting at. Uh, if you configure it so that uh, you can pass it from the kernel command line, yes, there's an argument to tell it where it's located. Yeah. If you, yeah. if you configure it with the stock configuration, the A tag from your bootloader tells you where to expect the device tree binary to be. But you can also configure the kernel so that when you compile it, the device tree blob is actually compiled in with your kernel at the same time. So when it boots up, it doesn't even have to know where it's at because it's part of the kernel. Menu. So there's multiple uh, kernel config options that you can choose from. It's just that the one that Joel generally works with is specifically the, this particular type of configuration. But that's that, that's kind of de deprecated, right? Uh, well, they're still supporting it, and they plan on it for quite some time because there's a lot of different uh, vendors that are shipping uh, half configuration with device tree, half would not, so there, it's going to be supported for a long time. So you specify the address. Yeah, yeah but, but that's still, again, like that's kernel configuration. It's not command line, right? Well, you can configure the kernel to accept a kernel command line to tell it where the device tree blob is. Okay. It's just that that's not the standard that you guys at TI use. Okay. Why, why don't we at TI just link it into the kernel and leave it alone? So seems like that would be more reliable, you don't have to look anywhere else for it. You can also specify some of this stuff in the actual bootloaders if you're working on a very low level. So, okay, it's I like you're passing in the my kernel's here, my RAM disk is here, I set this up. And the, uh, yeah, you're, you're right. And the, the other reason is like, uh, you can boot on fundamentally different kind of memory uh, architectures. Like, and the kernel may not know that, I mean, you can't hard code you don't hard code addresses in a kernel. I'm just saying that it seems like if if it's linked into the kernel and it's part of the kernel, then it doesn't really have to worry about setting up a RAM disk and then loading it from there. I mean, it just it seems like that would no um, the number of variables. Yeah, but you can't that that you can't configure everything into the kernel. Like, I think one of the points is you'd like the kernel to be able to adjust to the changes in. And uh, device tree. Like just saying, well, we just put it in one board. Why not put it in one in one place and then not have to worry about? Well, kind of the, the argument with that is, if you're doing the kernel in one place and the device tree blob in the other, is in theory, again, in theory, this is the way it's going to be, and that's the direction everybody is going. That you only have to write the device tree binary one time, and if you want to upgrade the kernel that description of the hardware will never actually change and you only have to upgrade the kernel. And so if you're a, a, a vendor creating you know, 12 products based on uh, a particular design and you have one kernel that supports all 12 of those devices, you only have to distribute one kernel and assume that the device tree that's already loaded on the device describes the hardware properly. Still doesn't get around some of the issues with setting up your config stuff because you have and it's like a lot of different devices that are running all off of the same kernel, but with totally different configs. Exactly. And, and when you talk about the multi-platform uh, uh, kind of booting, you can't like ask the, the kernel that you compile to look at only one location for the device tree blob, because on another ARM platform, maybe the memory map is different for the DDR, right? So maybe you can't access those same addresses, right? Does that? So it's not like you you put everything in the kernel and then you just expect it to work. Kernel can't make any assumptions about that. It can't it can't make any assumptions. So that's basically about the device tree overlays. To have this kind of plug and play uh, type of uh, thing where you want to modify the device tree on an already boarded kernel.
just just a little anecdote uh, or anecdotal uh, comment on that. Uh, your your question and comment came up at the recent embedded Linux conference in Europe, along with the kernel summit. Uh, it was meant to be a, a, a 30 minute question and answer session dealing with that particular issue. It ended up being an all day session, and literally, I kid you not, towards the end of the day, I thought it was going to come to uh, fights with you know actually people hitting each other. It was such a hotly debated item. I didn't throw my question. Well, if you were fighting, you have to turn this to what I'm doing. Really, what are the fights in CRT? Throw a box and knives. So there you go. I would draw my question. So who is yeah. so who's shipping this like this? This what you said? There's there's several different combinations. The one that's happening right now. By far the most is the combination where the device tree blob is actually compiled in with the kernel. Um, most of the companies like Sony, um, uh, Samsung, Samsung, Exynos uh, processors. Yeah, all of those guys are doing it as a single kernel right now. Uh, the smaller companies that have uh, maybe uh, 15 <coughs> products that have slight vari variations but are based on all the same closely related kernel, they're beginning to have the separate where it's a device tree for that device in one location and a generic kernel that runs on all 15 boards. Is that licensing issues? No, no it's just an update. Uh, it's, it, they don't want to have to, yeah, they don't want to have to develop 15 different kernels and, di and distribute 15 Well, I mean, if you can take the same thing, if you've ever like opened up the kernel for the OMAPs, you can see all the, and the device trees for, you can see, okay, this works on the Panda board, this works for the, the Blackberry, this works for this, this works for all these different pieces. Yeah. They're all using the same exact kernel. Now where they hit variations is on the device blobs and on yeah. the configs. Yeah. Exactly. And it's just turning stuff on and off that right. at, at that point. And, and the long-term goal is that once you have a true valid device tree description of your hardware, you should never have to change that no matter what you do with the kernel. Because the device tree is a description of what hardware you have and what where it's connected. And, and as long as that never changes, you know, uh, how many times is your hardware going to change with a digital camera? The description of that hardware for that camera is going to be fixed as long as you you haven't gone in hacked on it, it's going to be the same but that every can time. Be that's kind of a, tricky that's because of product variation. Exactly. Yeah, and then, and so, then you hit all yeah. kinds of issues where really the same kernel would apply, but because your frame buffer is different, the device lob that matched with the previous kernel isn't going to necessarily match with this. Yeah, there, there, there are variations, and sometimes you run stuff at different frame rate, or you don't have EDID support, and you need to change the pixel clock or something. Sometimes you have a screw with the Or the chipset's <coughs> brand new and different that yeah. somebody else sent you. Yeah. And it can make updates a pain in the butt because you could end up having to include a, having totally different set of device blobs that are, uh, that have to support like three different variations of hardware uh, in one set, yeah. which can be, yeah, I've had so, with that. So I just, uh, I'll move on. So the last processor we don't know is a Nikon. Uh, Exynos is a Samsung. Uh, Qualcomm has the Snapdragon series you create, and then TI's got OMAP and Citara and a few other ones, but OMAP's dead, right? Yeah, that's a different story. <laughs> I, I hired Korea to do so. Okay. <laughs> so I'll put that to you. But, yeah. yeah. So. Uh, so, uh, so speaking of uh, the, uh, the the whole overlay concept, uh, I was talking about like maybe a good question to think about is how do you add an LCD controller to uh, to a, like a spy bus or something at runtime? Like how do you do that? And so if if you were to take that, this was the device tree structure in the kernel memory after it booted. You would have something like this maybe on the on the on the spy bus. Uh, mm -hmm. So basically, the kernel would. Look at the spy bus and say that it's actually disabled, so I'm not going to trouble the spy controller, and it's not even probably going to show up the the spy the bus node at all. So the status property is something I didn't talk about. It basically tells 
the current ignore that device tree node. So if you have a property um, in in uh, in your node and you say status disabled, the kernel ignores that property. Uh, and the idea is that you can have these uh, device tree files and you can kind of include them in your board device tree file and you can change the status to, to enable saying that, hey, I've, I want to use the spy bus on this board variant. Uh, so uh, another, uh, going back to the camera example, generally speaking, when you boot it up, that camera hard hardware is not going to ever change. But if you think about it, let's say a third-party manufacturer creates a uh, SPI-based uh, controller for your flash. So you could buy a third-party flash uh, module to put on your camera. You need to be have a way to identify when you put that uh, flash on your camera, the physical description of the camera has changed. So you need a methodology in order to create a new device tree based on the original one, but slightly modified by overlaying the change on top of that. Yeah, at runtime. Exactly. Yeah. So essentially, a file would open, open data points, and then you just look at data from the, the camera, so from the new flash. Exactly. Okay. So I just, I'll finish with this, like, this will continue to say that, so this is, the, this is what it looks like, and then all of a sudden, I'll say some magic happens, and then the, the new device tree, would actually look like, like, look like this, you know, status changes to enable, and now all of a sudden you have a new LCD node, child node inside the spy. So the kernel would set up the spy bus, and you would have a new LCD device uh, instantiated on the platform bus, and those type of things. So, so, uh, so now, now I, because I love going into internals, I went into the internals of this stuff as well, and uh, so. I wanted to see how overlays really work. How does it really do the, these type of things? And so, so there are basically three simple ways uh, that the original device tree was modified by Pentelus to, to add device tree overlay support. Uh, the first thing he did was he created a new implicit uh, a node inside the device tree called, uh, it's called a lookup node or something. It's actually hidden. And they see the node as a lookup table that maps each uh, node that has a label in front of it uh, to the, the full node of the path. So you, here you have a label called spy1. Labels don't mean anything in the device tree blob internal format. It's just a way for you to shorthand a, a node name. So instead of writing like spy at x0, x, whatever, you just say spy1 colon, you know, it's a short way of referencing it. If you were to ever create a p-handle out of it, you would just use spy1. So, so he created a lookup table between the labels. So every device tree uh, blob would have a, uh, an implicit table in it, mapping the labels to the to the full path of the device tree node that is being referenced. So now note that device tree nodes are act actually can be nested at any arbitrary level. So you'd have a full path that uniquely identifies that node. So this lookup table basically takes each label and it maps it to the full path. So, any questions on that? Is it like a, a plug and play compatibility to the device on the tree and stuff? Yeah, it's kind of like the whole concept of overlays that, that at runtime anybody can modify the live device tree by loading these fragment device tree blocks. Say something is plugged in or dynamically. Is that how USB works? <coughs> um, it's not quite the same. No. It's, it's like, a, think of it more like a, on the Udo or whatever, when you're running and you've already got the HDMI, but then you plug in the LVDS. And again, these devices are not smart enough to be enumerated and stuff, like I was saying. So this, this kind of helps in a way. So nodes can either be referenced through their unique label or through their unique path. So both are unique, the label and the path. So you can uh, reference a node to create a handle in uh, any of those ways. So I actually wanted to show you, um, but I, I don't think, uh, I, I'm not sure what value it will hold, but it's basically uh, what I wanted to show you is, uh, actually, I think we have time, right? Um, do we? I don't know how much you have left. Yeah, I just have a couple of slides, like maybe two or, <laughs> okay, we'll come back to this later, and we'll see. Uh, 
Then, then what Pendelis did is, apart from this, uh, uh, actually, I, I, I really, I really should show you what a fragment device tree file looks like. Otherwise, it's not going to make much, uh, much sense. So, maybe another fifteen minutes. Sure. <laughs> so, uh, let me show you one at a time, I guess. So this is what a fragment looks like. This is one fragment right here. Um, and then there's, there's like these different fragments. And each fragment is supposed to modify the live device tree. That was the whole point. So. So let's go to this fragment, and what it does is it does a kernel, go to the spike a node in the device tree, and overlay the, all these properties on top of that. So now effectively, what you have is a spy node that whose status has changed to OK, which means the spy bus should be active, and then it adds at this node, which kind of instantiates the device tree. Uh, uh, sorry, it, it creates the platform devices and all that. How, how do you? Put this into the kernel, is it like a, a, a mod probe or something, or yeah. There's a uh, there's a, a sysfs or a proc sysfs file that you you basically tell it the the name of the <coughs> blob and then it uses a request it uses the request firmware interface, which it uses for a lot of other things. So the same request firmware interface is used to to load the that's just the loading part of it. Once it's in memory, uh, that's what I'm talking about. But how, how the block gets to memory is through the request firmware interface. You have a sysfs entry that you tell it what the name of the firmware blob is that it needs to load. And you do this while, it's, while the kernel's running? Yes. That's why it's sysfs, because, yeah. So you, you have a compatible property here, which basically tells the kernel that, uh, OK, we have a new device now. Let's find the driver that has the same compatible property. and and that calls the probe function of the of the LCD driver, and then magically you start seeing pictures on your LCD display. So the difference between a bus that can be enumerated and of the platform bus is exactly that. You have to tell it tell the kernel you have to poke it through sysfs that this is the you know you you have to you have to give it an input. It's not going to automatically work. So so. So the points node and the device tree blob uh, fragment, you would have a fragment node, which uh, tells you it's basically a, a simple node that has a target property which tells which you're supposed to uh, you're supposed to init, you're supposed to assign the, the p handle of the node that you want to modify at runtime. Then you have an overlay child node of the fragment node, and then you have all these properties. I kind of have a question about that. Um, so, is it expected that the user would do this every time they boot the kernel, or is there some way to, to wrap that in the boot parameters? So that I, I think it's possible. If you can, you can load firmware when the kernel boots. Uh, you can also just put it inside your init or start it as a service from the init. So you can yeah, load I think you you still need to do it manually. You can compile the. I'm just blog. wondering if you're if you're a vendor doing this. And you expect the person that has it that bought your new gizmo, you got to tell them to put this in the net. No, there's there's three three different ways that you can do this. Um, you can actually change the command line to say specifically load this overlay once you've gotten to a point where you can. So, so there is a command line that you can force it in directly from the bootloader. That's the first way. The second way is traditionally you can actually specify in your kernel a place to check to see if other devices are there and load them. And traditionally, what like for instance, uh, a lot of people do even on the camera device that we were using as an example, your flash device will have an I2C EEPROM on it and it will check that bus and say, is there an EEPROM out there? Okay, yeah. if there is, 
read the name of the device that's out there and check these overlays to see if one of those exists. If it does exist, then, then go it. ahead and load it. Yeah, and the blob itself would be in the EEPROM. So it's kind of a nice way to... That, that makes sense then. That makes yeah. a lot more sense because you really don't want a customer with a camera yeah. to have to go and hack their kernel yeah. to use a, a new flash. Well, you, you actually already used this methodology in the past, and it's been there for actually about 10 years. Uh, when you buy a new PC and you put a new uh, LCD panel uh, or CRT into it, and you boot up, normally it will automatically detect the resolution and say you've got a Samsung 17-inch. How does it know to do that? That panel, the panel actually has what's uh, an IQ has an I2C EEPROM in it and it's actually stored that information and it qualifies that and all we've done in most of these products now is to replace that functionality on many different things. Um, one of the biggest things that we're running into now is a lot of the Linux devices are actually moving into automotive applications and these are long-term applications where uh, a manufacturer may make a car for seven years but the, the original LCD panel that's uh, part of the radio may not be available for that seven years. So what they include in that particular radio module for that LCD panel is an EEPROM so they can identify the specifications of that LCD. Yeah. And, and it goes beyond even now into uh, you know relay modules and uh, GPS modules in your car or brake modules. Even the uh, tire sensors now uh, that detect the pressure in your in the tires are coming with the EE problems in them to identify the version of it. Sorry. And sometimes well, some and of the yeah, even the uh, even this the uh, exactly. there's a, also a standard that has an EEPROM problem on the DDR chips that you plug in exactly. to actually uh, find out what the timings are of that DDR and the the firmware would in instantiate the memory controller with those values. So. It's pretty common, uh, common concept. So that's that's what it looks like. So uh, so every uh, so, so then what <coughs> and then what was done was for every fragment node that I just showed you, uh, the kernel would do uh, as I was saying it would check the target property and overlay it and all that. Uh, so I think I, I think I've covered what I was going to. Talk about in this slide. So in the in the fragment diversity blob, there's there's another table that would map uh, that would uh, so so okay so so yeah we had a lack of continuity so I'm kind of lost myself but. So the last thing I talked about was the fix-up table, which would uh, map uh, labels to the full path of the node, so that when you load a fragment, the kernel uh, can go to that particular node and it can overlay onto it. Apart from the, the fix-up table, uh, just like just like any uh, dynamically loaded uh, program, like uh, you load a shared library in, in your memory, uh, uh, when a program is running, you, you can't just execute things, you have to fix things up because the shared library can be loaded anywhere in, in the memory. So uh, what, a kernel, uh, what a linker does is it, uh, it has these uh, simple tables in, the, in executables that, like for example, printf, right? Uh, you, you would have this table that would, 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 uh, would contain, a, contain printf's address, but that is not known when you compile your program. So, only after the shared library is loaded can you actually fix do those fix-ups. So it's, it's kind of the same concept here. Uh, uh, like picture scenario where you have a fragment that refers to a DMA controller node. And you have no idea when you compile the fragment what the p-handle value of the DMA controller node is. If you work, if you work, if that fragment was a part of the, 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 the same device tree file where the DMA controller node was, then you know what the p handle is, right? And you can at compile time you can you can assign that value. But the challenge with device tree overlays is there's no way for you you don't have access to the base device tree that you want to modify at runtime, and you still want to compile this fragment. So what do you do? So 
Pentelis uh, came up with this whole table in the fragment that would kind of tell the kernel that you need to go to these properties that refer to p-handles in the fragment, and you need to change the values to what the, the p-handle values, like what the data. <coughs> For example, if the say hypothetically the LCD controller is referring to the DMA node, so uh, there would be a there would be a table in the fragment that would that would that would tell the kernel go to this property in the LCD uh, node and assign the p-handle for the DMA controller. To, to that property. So there would be, so you need a table that actually does, actually specify that. So Pendelis came up with this table where you have a, you have a whole you have the path to the node carrying the property in a fragment. You have the name of the property and you have the label that that property refers to. So in, in, in my example uh, the path to the node would be the LCD uh, node in the fragment. Property would be DMA and Label would be EDMA, like that's the name of the DMA controller. So, so then when the kernel loads the fragment, it, it 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 goes to the DMA's property in the LCD node, and it assigns the DMA controller's p-handle value. So, does that make sense, sort of? Like, so only then, only then those references are valid. So, I thought it was really cool. But then, then I I looked at it and I I saw it's really complex. So. I was like, I, I want to modify this and not have to do this thing dynamically at runtime. So I, I, mo I modified the device tree compiler to um, actually not assign p-handle values to nodes that are labeled, uh, not assign p-handle values incrementally, but take the whole path uh, to that node and hash it, giving it a unique p-handle value. So, so that way the, the p-handle value of each node would be unique. And I, I would I would do the same thing in the in what the overlay. What happened in the in the base? You keep you could have the same device as you just have. Would that hash the same value? There are possibilities of collisions, but it was rare at the time I did this analysis. And I hashed every every node in the in every device tree file in the. I'm current. sure it's rare, but it could happen, right? Yeah. But there was no, not even one collision. I hashed every device tree node in every device tree file. There was no collision. It was a script. I just uh, it took uh, like a few seconds or something. Okay. Yeah. I was like thinking, I'm like really going through it and doing it would be. Oh. No way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I used pretty crappy checksum CRC32, and I still didn't have any collisions. So it was pretty. It's pretty decent. And the nice thing about this approach was it eliminated all the hidden tables. You just had to load the fragment in, and you didn't even need to do any kind of fix up kind of stuff. Uh, and I, I, I didn't end up submitting it because the original overlay stuff was itself not upstream, so I didn't submit my my work. It's rotting in some tree in some branch somewhere. So. GitHub. Yeah, somewhere. So, so. Really easy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I pushed it to GitHub. Yeah. So, so that's about device tree overlays. It's a very nice example showing the flexibility of device tree. I also did a presentation at. ELC uh, earlier this year, talking about another application of device trees where uh, you could actually uh, take, um, uh, you could actually apply it to a bootloader where you'd have, um, you could store all these different uh, binaries that you pass to the kernel, like RAM disk, uh, device tree blob, kernel image itself. You could you could wrap all of them into a single device tree, and the bootloader would pass that device tree and. Uh, get all the data from it. So it was a very flexible format. Uh, it's called the flattened image tree format. So that that was another very nice uh, application of it. So you could have a, you could have a device you could have a device tree blob with different kern, different kernels in there, and the bootloader would just pick up the correct kernel binary. So device tree compiler has support for binaries for quite some time now. So that's how, so the so basically the that feature of the compiler was exploited, where you can not only store values, but you can store entire binaries as, <coughs> as values of, of properties. So that's all I have. If you have any questions, we can open up for discussion. Don't look at me. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> you understand? Know <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, seems, it seems like a lot of this is very much geared towards the truly just regular embedded Linux um, stuff, but things do change depending on other um, Linux-based embedded operating systems that you might be running. Um, if you're running TZ, some things are, it's hard to do some of those other parameters because of conventions that are laid out in the operating system. Um, like, do you have any experience with that? No, I, I've, I've never mastered TZ, so I don't know experience that particular or, or Android or <coughs> the Ubuntu mobile thing has some of the same uh, conventions like the the conventions are all documented yeah they are everybody has to just follow that otherwise I mean I don't see that's the whole concept of device tree bindings and those type of things where everything has to be documented others you, you might have a hard time writing your own device tree file so and, and there's also this whole concept of ABI where you can't go backwards as in like to introduce a particular convention and you can't uh, you have to still support that convention so I don't know if that answers your question but no I was just wanting you to elaborate a little bit more of your own experiences it wasn't yeah necessarily I, a question okay <clears throat> Questions? Yeah, I guess I'll close with that then. Uh, yeah, you can feel free to email me or, you know, if you have any questions.